the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Well, a big welcome to everyone to the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions, which is a series of online events, videos, and podcasts where we look at the biggest issues faced by businesses and individuals today. There have been numerous changes to the proposed uh, planning system, and this webinar aims to provide a really high-level roundup of what those changes are and some, definitely not all, of those associated issues arising from them. I'm Anita Rivera. I head up the planning team here, and I'll be your host. From the Mishcon planning team, introducing to you Tom Barton, who is going to discuss changes to the use classes order, Roisin Hogan, who will take us through recent uh, new permitted development rights, and Martin Hanmore, who's going to provide a general overview of the planning white paper and highlight some of the proposals. And we're also extremely grateful to be joined by Robert Walton, QC of Landmark Chambers, who will be participating in the Q&A sessions, as well as a big part of the discussion. Without any further hesitation, I would like to hand over to Tom, who's going to talk about the use classes order. So Tom, over to you. Thanks so much, Anita. So yeah, I'm going to walk you through the, uh, the recent changes to the use class order. So the big one, new use class E. So this is described as commercial business and service uses. And the intention was for all the uses that you might find going on a typical city centre mixed use building would all be moved into a single class. This would allow this fluidity of use without the need to apply for planning permission for a change of use. And what's included in there is shops, financial and professional services, cafes and restaurants, offices, health centres, creche, nurseries and gyms. So let's have a look at the next one, use class uh, F1. Learning in non-residential institutions, so that's things like schools, training centres, museums, public libraries, public courts. All of these kind of uses that have a high cultural value, but which aren't necessarily particularly high yielding. Next up, use class F2, so this is local community uses. Uh, shops of no more than 280 square metres selling essential goods, including food, at least one kilometre from another shop. Other uses within F2 are halls and community uh, meeting spaces, uh, indoor and outdoor swimming, bath, skating, and outdoor sports. And last but not least, the use class, which isn't strictly a use class, so sui generis. So this is for uses that, for, that are considered to be without classification. In there now, we've got pub and drinking establishments, formerly A4, takeaways, uh, and cinemas, uh, concert halls, bingos, and dance halls. And now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Robin and Anita to come back and join us. Hello, thanks very much. Um, I, I think, Rob, let's talk about conditions. There's so much case law on uh, conditions uh, seeking to, to, to limit the uses of, of that consent. Um, and this sounds like it's gonna be a field day yet again, the interpretation of old conditions on new consents. And I'm just wondering, while the government is seeking to expand flexibility, the likelihood is that local authorities will seek to constrict it as much as they can. What problems do you see being faced by, by developers with local authorities who seek to do that? The way to look at it is, 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 is twofold. One, we have to look at existing permissions and see whether there are restrictions uh, um, in those conditions that actually you know, stop you changing from a, a particular use uh, to another, even though you might be able to do that through the use classes order uh, now. And then secondly, of course, it's what authorities will seek to do in the future when they grant planning permission and whether they take a, um, an approach that's more restrictive than perhaps the government is, is wishing for at the moment. And as you say, there's a whole raft mm -hmm. of cases on how you interpret existing uh, conditions. It will be a case by case uh, um, a piece of work to see what the precise wording of that condition says. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, also because, you know, there are policy constraints to the ability to impose a condition that's not purely related to the consents, particularly when the government initiative is to actually increase kind of flexibility. Well, um, we're gonna uh, chug on through. I'd like to introduce next uh, Roisin, who is going to talk about permitted development rights. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all well. So PD rights allow building works and changes of use to be carried out without the need for planning permission. This light touch regime usually requires certain matters to be approved by the council before PD right can be exercised. And this is known as prior approval. 
This year, we have seen government respond quickly and uh, introduce PD rights as a reaction to uh, COVID and the resulting economic downturn. These new rights allow restaurants and cafes to operate as takeaways. This right is time limited and will expire on the 23rd of March next year. There's also a right to use land for any purpose for not more than 28 days. And this right is also time limited and will expire at the end of this year. And alongside that, there's another right for local authorities to hold markets and they can do this for an unlimited number of days. And again, this right is also time limited and will expire on the 23rd of March next year. Alongside this, the government has also introduced a number of PD rights to allow residential unit uses to supplement traditional town centre uses. So alongside the existing PD right for office to residential conversions, it's also now possible to add additional stories to dwelling houses, add additional stories to commercial mixed use or res uh, residential buildings to create new flats. And uh, controversially, there's also a new PD right to demolish a detached commercial or residential building and replace it with an individual block of flats or a detached dwelling house. So uh, a campaign group in the last couple of weeks has launched a judicial review challenge against the introduction of these new residential PD rights. The grounds of challenge are threefold. They uh, cover the lack of proper consultation and parliamentary debate, the failure to carry out an environmental assessment and the lack of an appropriate equality impact assessments. There's a rolled up hearing that's due to take place in October. The judge will decide one, whether to grant the campaign group permission to bring the JR challenge and then will then go on to actually hear the substantive uh, JR challenge if, if permission is granted. So I will now ask Rob and Anita to rejoin to discuss some of the wider impacts of these new PD rights. Thanks Rasheen. Um, if you're a lawyer, you probably have read the grounds for the JR challenge, and I have to say, they were quite persuasive and compelling. Robert, what do you think about the strength of that challenge that's been lodged? I think there, it's definitely a, a robust defence can be put in. Um, what they've got to show, just in very brief terms, is that the, for the first ground is that the um, legislation is, is a plan or programme for the purposes of uh, the SEA directive, and I think they've got some difficulty on that, just because it not, doesn't seem to me to, to meet the definition, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, the other grounds, for example, a lack of consultation, absolutely. Even if that could be proved, um, and all, all that's required is a witness, witness statement from the Secretary of State, so now I did take that into account. Um, well, where do we go from there? Uh, it, it, even if it got quashed, um, I think absolutely. We can see the government's intention here. Um, and so, uh, slightly ironically, despite the lack of consultation, even if there were further, further consultation, it would be quite surprising, wouldn't it, if the government didn't come up with something uh, very similar to what they've got on the table already. So Tom and Roisin have just talked about the changes to planning law, which have already come into force. And we're now going to focus on the changes that are proposed, so that are still the subject of some consultation. I'd like to hand over to Martin, who will be discussing the white paper. So Martin, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm going to be talking about the government's white paper, which is entitled Planning for the Future. So the white paper, um, it's divided into three what it calls pillars. The first one is called Planning for Development Plans. And this is a collection of proposals that are really set to shake up the way that the plan making system works. The way that the white paper proceeds really is to look at the um, heavy burden on local authorities of preparing uh, development plans. So they don't have a track record of getting plans in place that's particularly fantastic. And so the white paper proposals effectively fill it out, um, elements of the plan making process that are riddled with problems that cause some of the longest delays and the biggest debates. And anywhere they can, the, the proposals are really just to chop those elements out of the system altogether. Where there are difficult issues that can't simply be chopped out of the system, the idea is to hoover these up to a national level, to remove them from the local authorities remit and take centralised control over some of the really critical aspects of development plans. The second one is called 
planning for beautiful and sustainable places. It's difficult to define what planning for beauty really means. But when you look behind that, I think actually there are some, some powerful ideas um, built into what, what the white paper is proposing. The other central plank of pillar two is all about simplifying the environmental assessments that are needed to get to the stage of having planning permission. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of detail yet on exactly how that simplification is going to happen. We've got very bold statements um, of wanting to sweep aside all of the red tape and the unnecessary process. Um, all I can say at this stage, if we could get to an outcomes focused environmental impact assessment and, and other technical assessment regime, that there is scope to significantly improve on what has become a very paper driven, some in some cases checkbox, often literally checkbox exercise. The last piece is the changes to infrastructure. And these are really, really important. Um, they'll affect every scheme. The, the proposal is to take SIL and Section 106 and mash them together into a single combined uh, development tax, effectively. And the really, really important thing about that proposal is that it includes affordable housing within the SIL type tax. So at that point, if I can uh, invite Rob and Anita back to your screens. I'd like to kind of discuss three of the pillars. So, so a fundamental question for, for each one of the three pillars. Robert, w what do you see the role of the appeals process changing under a more kind of rules-based development management system? So the, this rule-based situation is, is absolutely, the, the aim is to, when the plan is adopted, people know what's coming. And if you can have a design guide alongside that, prepared, for example, at the local level, then somebody should be able to sit down with those two documents and pretty much envisage what's coming forward. And the rule should get rid of so much of that debate at appeal stage, shouldn't you, as to whether the building is in fact a bit too close to. If there's someone saying, look, 10 metres back at three storeys in height is fine, then you, know, you de-risk everything. But then there will still be that element of, well, does it comply with uh, what we're trying to see here by way of good design? So um, hopefully less yeah. debate, but still some, I fear. Well, that kind of leads quite nicely into this concept of beauty. Um, you know, historically, these design guides, I mean, neighborhood planning has basically been the forefront of, of creating great design guides. Widespread adoption of a design guide is really ambitious. Um, what lessons do you think that developers should carry from neighborhood planning successes uh, in terms of garnering local support for design guides that basically support their developments? I think it's, it's always going to be engagement, isn't it, at local level, if it looks like there might be a design guide coming forward at that very, that very local level. But there is the fallback situation that if um, you know, there isn't a, a neighbourhood uh, level design guide coming forward, then actually it's going to fall back ultimately to the national design guide. So you know, developers shouldn't be too concerned uh, about um, that process stalling at local level. But if mm -hmm. they can get traction with it and get involved, engagement properly, then it's, it's only going to help. So coming on to the final pillar, the third pillar, which I think a lot of our audience would be incredibly interested to talk about, um, is infrastructure. Do you think that there's going to be some sort of role for a quid pro quo in the form of agreements between developers and councils, which potentially in advance, even maybe of submitting their application, is sorted out to basically ensure that some of the funding is allocated, even, even if borrowed if necessary, early enough to meet the need and to actually benefit a specific development? So this is all about front loading uh, and your point there about borrowing, the encouragement for councils to borrow to get the infrastructure in place ahead of development coming forward and then uh, if, if the money's recovered from developers uh, down the line so be it um, it's that heavy lifting that's going to be absolutely critical i think there is a real problem in terms of putting that all on uh, local authorities or to the extent currently being proposed what we need here is um, national oversight to ensure that uh, authorities are delivering at the local level up front because then that de-risks de everything in terms of uh, delivery and uh, the the impacts that can arise if it's not in place so it's they, they are going to need some help to, to get to whether it's you know, it's the homes england approach whether it's growth deals it's those growth deals infrastructure mm -hmm. those sorts of things have to be put in place to make this successful 
we are we are coming to to the end of our um, our time. But could I invite Tom and Rasheen back? I, I would just like to say a huge thank you um, to the audience for attending the session, and also to our speakers uh, Martin, Tom, Rasheen, and to our lovely guests Robert Walton. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you hugely again for all attending the Mishkan Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.